Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. I want to begin just by thanking Dalton for kicking the series off, uh, introducing the topic and what we're going to do, and uh, laying out some caveats, some qualifiers, um, just so there, there won't be any misunderstanding. Again, this is a tremendously controversial, even contentious topic. And it's so important that everyone who listens, whether you agree with us or disagree with us, understand the spirit that we're coming at, uh, that we're approaching this from. This is not an adversarial, we're taking a position, but with regard to those that we're disagreeing with, it is not adversarial in any way, shape, or form. We are attempting to approach this in a responsible, loving, yet shepherdly way. I mean, this is not, let me just begin by saying and agreeing with Dalton, this is not just irrelevant end time trivia. If we are the generation that will inherit the culmination of all prophecy, if we will live to see the great tribulation, then yes, absolutely. First of all, I would say it's really actually important for all Christians down throughout all of history, but so much more so, eminently so, if we are indeed the generation that will live to see these things. And let me just say, I genuinely believe that we are the generation that will live to see these things. I believe these things could be much closer uh, than many people believe. Again, I don't claim to know the timing. I want to be very clear. But I just have this sense that we are getting very close. Again, I could be wrong. Regardless, this information is relevant. It's very applicational. How we understand, whether we understand uh, the timing of the rapture, properly or improperly, this will directly affect the way you and I live as Christians, the way we relate to numerous texts throughout the New Testament. It is very relevant information. Now, I'll unpack this a bit more. Um, what I want to do is just begin by sort of framing out our game plan. You know, sort of what is the schedule? Because for some of you watching this, you know, you may faithfully follow every single session and go through this may really be something that interests you. Uh, for some of you, you go, ah, I'm interested in the timing of the rapture, but, you know, I've studied this pretty thoroughly. I'm just interested in what they have to say with regard to this particular passage or this text or on this topic. And so you may just jump in every now and then and catch, you know, select sessions. So if that's you, I'm going to kind of tell you what our general game plan is, and it's subject to change. I mean, we've got it sort of framed out, but as you get into something, we may say, oh gosh, we need to talk about this, and um, this is sort of the way that Dalton and I tag team back and forth, but I think we have the general uh, framework laid out. So again, Dalton has introduced the topic. Again, I'm piggybacking off of some of the things, expanding upon some of the things that Dalton talked about in last week's session. And then after this, Dalton is going to jump in and he's going to do the lion's share of working through the primary rapture passages. Okay, so the primary rapture text, the passages that everybody turns to when discussing the rapture, he's going to work through those carefully and, you know, just discuss these. So these are sort of the passages that directly speak of and relate to the issue of the rapture. Now, after he's done, and I'm not sure exactly how many sessions he'll do or how many it will take to sort of work through all these different texts and some of the main arguments and so forth, then I'm going to jump in and I'll work through some of the primary text passages and arguments that are often used and employed by those from the pre-tribulational camp. So the various arguments and texts that are often cited, quoted, or alluded to by those who believe in the pre-tribulational rapture and argument by argument, passage by passage, text by text, verse by verse, I'm going to work through all of these uh, arguments. So, for example, um, when I jump back in, I'll deal with the issue of imminency. Does the Bible really teach imminency? I mean, imminency or the doctrine of imminency is one of the foundational doctrines that is held and employed by pre-tribulationists to argue for pre-tribulational rapture. So we'll explore that. Does the Bible really teach imminency? Or does it teach urgency and readiness? Uh, we'll look at, for example, Revelation 3.10. Does Revelation 3.10 really teach a pre-tribulational rapture? As so many pre-tribbers -trib, pre believe. Um, we'll discuss the argument, for example. Does, why is the church never mentioned after Revelation 4, etc., etc., etc.? Okay, so there's numerous texts, um, passages that are cited, but we'll also get into other issues, not just particular verses, but arguments, or I'll even say cliches that are often cited. Um, you'll often hear pre-tribbers say things like, 
I'm pre-trib because God would never beat up his bride. Far be it from God that he would ever do that to his bride. What, what type of character uh, would, you know, would that speak of, of God if he beat up his bride? And this type of thing. So these are arguments, or again, cliches. Or they're sort of little things that are just thrown out there, not necessarily rooted in any particular text, but they're very common. So we're going to look at things like that. Um, then when we're done with, again, these primary pre-tribulational proof texts and arguments, then I'm going to do a very thorough survey of what the church has believed about these things down through history. We're going to do a survey of what the early church believed with regard to the timing of the rapture. And then after that, I'm going to actually do several sessions. And some of these sessions may be as short as 15, 20 minutes. Some of them may be very brief. Others will be a, a bit longer, 30, 40, or even 50 minutes. We're going to try to keep them a little bit shorter. I know, I know, I always say this, but then I talk forever. We're going to keep these shorter, uh, legitimately shorter. I think 30 to 40 minutes will sort of be the average time span. But I'm going to actually work through um, several different particular arguments. And these are newer arguments. When I say newer, within the past several years, there has been suddenly, uh, again, suddenly, just in the past several years, um, a handful of teachers who are scouring through the writings of the early church and, and even like up into the medieval period and saying, oh, look, this guy said this. He is clearly articulating pre-tribulationism. So they'll say the early church actually held, or many within the early church held, the pre-tribulational rapture. And they'll quote a little quote here and say, see, I'm going to actually work through these and debunk them. Not all of them, obviously, but I'm actually going to spend a handful of sessions debunking um, a lot of these issues. Another thing that many of you may be interested in, I'm actually going to take a few sessions to discuss this issue of um, Jewish wedding rituals. Do Jewish wedding rituals prove or validate a pre-tribulational rapture? And specifically, I'm going to critique the movie called Before the Wrath. I may actually even spend a couple sessions working through this film. If you don't know what Before the Wrath is, uh, it was actually arguably or, or allegedly, I should say, the biggest Christian film of 2020. Okay, so it came out sort of at the, uh, you know, as COVID was exploding, the film was released, and numerous people, um, and let me just say this, by the way, so... If you follow me on Twitter, you may be like, well, Joel, you're, you know, kind of a fighty guy. You seem to be or always causing trouble or this sort of thing. Um, I, I'm very unconventional in the way that I use social media as a public figure, as a minister. And I get that. I'm just, I'm not good at trying to pretend to, you know, put on some facade. I often use social media to try to get, uh, uh, you know, to try to test the pulse of what's out there, you know? So I'll sometimes throw stuff out there and just see what type of reaction I get and go, okay, this is a common reaction. This is a common sentiment. This is a common cliche that you'll often hear because this is what the people think, you know? And I want to respond to what the people think, not just what I think the people think, okay? So um, in throwing out some of these issues as I've been preparing for this session, a lot of people go, oh, you need to watch the film Before the Wrath. It proves a pre-tribulational rapture. That's what you'll hear people say. I'm going to work through this quite carefully, and um, I'll just say this beforehand. It is very disheartening. It's actually devastating. Uh, my critique will be devastating of the film, um, but we'll, as we'll see, there is actually some, and I say this beforehand, and I'm in dialogue um, with the creators of the film and some of the primary um, folks who have the authorities that are interviewed in the film, there is some clearly, and, and again, I say this with the fear of the Lord, because I do not want to be the type of guy that's out there criticizing or critiquing or being like a heresy hunter. That is not my calling. Um, but the film, the creators of the film and some in the film, employ legitimate dishonesty. Like outright, they know they're being dishonest and they do it anyway and try to justify it. And yes, I have interacted with them personally. Um, and we're, as I said, we're in dialogue, but it's, that's going to be pretty explosive. Again, allegedly the biggest Christian film of 2020 is actually built upon dishonesty 
uh, if not outright fraud. I'm just going to say that. Okay. Um, we'll get to that in a few sessions. We'll also, and in the midst of all of this, Dalton may jump in here and there. Um, there's a handful of different topics that I know that he's going to really want to sort of express uh, his voice on. So again, we're not exactly clear. It'll probably be about 35, maybe as many as 40 sessions. So what that means is we'll be releasing one session every week, and this is going to go all the way until September, maybe through September. It may go all the way till about October of this year, 2023. Um, so again, 30 to 40 sessions. You go, you're going to do 30 or 40 sessions just on the rapture? Yes, absolutely. We could do 100. We could do 100, but we, in order to do that, we would really geek out. And, you know, there would only be like five, uh, you know, people watching it and this sort of thing. We don't want to beat a dead horse, but we do want to cover all of the main relevant arguments and texts. If you're a Berean, if you're someone who doesn't simply trust what I say, and I don't want you to trust what I say, I want you to research it. I want you to look it up. I want you to push back. That's what a good Berean does. Not as a cynical skeptic, okay, but as someone who tests all things. I don't want you to be a good student of me. I want you to be a student of the scriptures. And quite frankly, too many in the church today are very good students of their teachers. They're not always thorough students of the scriptures. That's what the spirit of being a Berean is. Students of the scriptures, testing these things to see whether or not they are true. Okay, but if you're a faithful Berean, we're going to try to cover all of the main, again, text, passages, arguments, just all of the relevant information, as well as, after we do a lot of this stuff, we're going to take some time to really dial down and focus a bit more on the relevance of it all. Why does it matter? Again, this is not just trivia. It's not just theology. It's not like, well, here's an argument and here's an argument. And again, I can do that until the cows come home. And exploring and understanding arguments, their validity or their, their weakness, whether they're fallacious arguments or this sort of thing, these things are relevant discussions. Ah, but it can become a bit trivial. It can become a bit... Um, yeah, in, in any case... We want to focus on why these things matter. What is the application? And we will take some time to do that. We'll discuss the issue of what does it mean from a biblical perspective to be a false prophet? You know, and, and are there people, even that we love, that are essentially functioning as false prophets? And, um, and that's, a, again, a huge statement to make. But this is, the more that I peer into this, the more that I say, Lord, this is one of the greatest deceptions that is gripping a large segment of the body of Christ today. And I say that with fear and trembling. The pre-tribulational rapture, and, and again, if you're watching this and you hold to the pre-tribulational rapture, uh, let me state, let me say this, and again, this is to piggyback off of what Dalton said in the previous session. Critiquing an idea does not equal critiquing the person that believes the idea. Okay, you can, you know, if we're dealing with some other issue, love the sinner, hate the sin, hate the sin, love the sinner, okay? I can say homosexuality is perverse. It is not according to the design of our creator. It is sinful. But that doesn't mean I hate every person that wrestles with homosexuality, right? I could love and have friends. Or I could have someone in my family. I don't. That, uh, you know, is a homo... Well, I guess Uncle Bob. I love Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob is uh, homosexual. But the point that everybody's got, uh, maybe not. Anyway, um, the point is this. In critiquing the doctrine, in critiquing the doctrine, do not take this personally. If you're watching this and you hold to the pre-tribulational rapture, do not take it personally. In critiquing an idea, in critiquing a doctrine, we are being faithful Bereans. We're not being enemies. We're not being adversaries. Critiquing a doctrine or an idea does not mean that we are adversaries or enemies or that we are critiquing the individuals that hold this, nor does it mean that we are critiquing the teachers that espouse this, okay? I have great friends. Look, um, over the past several years, I have spoken, for example, at Perry Stone's Prophecy Conference. I love Perry Stone. He's a friend. Um, now, before everyone jumps down my throat, I don't watch every single video that Perry does, um, in fact, I don't have time to watch much, so people be like, you like Perry, he says this, oh, you know, guilt by association, don't do that, okay? I don't know everything that Perry Stone, so don't, I'm just saying I love him as a person, I love him as a brother. He is died in the wool pre-trib, 
you know, and I, and look, when I'm in a man's house, if I'm speaking at a at a church or you know some a pastor is pre-trib, then I will absolutely respect that man. If I'm in someone's house, I will respect that man's house. I'm not going to get up at someone's conference or at their church and disagree with the host. That's just rude. It's disrespectful. Um, and so you know, look, I speak at pre pre-trib churches quite regularly. I know pastors and guys that I love. Let me tell you, um, for those that are familiar, I wrote the book, The Mystery of Catastrophe, um, with a missionary friend. His name is Nathan Graves. I sit on the board of his ministry. Nathan is one of the most godly, rock-solid brothers out there that I know. The Lord has bonded us um, through some shared common uh, tribulations, quite frankly, both of our, we wrote this book, The Mystery of Catastrophe. He is a man of God who I trust and respect deeply. He is, uh, you know, very strong pre-trib. We wrote a book together about the end times. Okay, please understand, this is not an issue to divide over. It is not an issue to fight over. It is worth, however, having robust discussions concerning it is worth being Bereans. It is worth chewing up over these things, again, because this issue matters. As Dalton said, this is actually at the heart of biblical hope, the return of Jesus, our inheritance, the end of the struggle. When we inherit immortality, when our bodies are clothed with immortality, with glorified, resurrected bodies, like when we inherit glorified, resurrected bodies, that is everything that we are laying down our lives for today. It's everything that we're hoping for. It's everything that we're looking forward to. When it happens is very relevant. It matters. And there are many warnings that are associated with this time that also matter. And I want to just touch on a few of these and then um, wrap up this session. So first of all, let me just say this. And I want to say this very specifically to anyone who's watching this who is who holds to the pre-tribulational rapture. And I want to be careful um, in how I say this. Let me, let me actually tell you a little personal story so that you'll know who I am. Let me say this before I, I jump into this issue. So I got saved. I had an experience that very much formed who I am as a person, as a young man. I got saved at 19. Um, probably the closest person that I have ever had to a brother in my life. He was a dear friend. His name was Mike. He actually lived with my mother and I for probably a year or two when we were young. Um, he, uh, you know, look, we were all problem kids back then, so I don't, I'm not bashing his parents. I don't really know the full story. I just know that he had got kicked out of his parents' house. He came to live with my mother. She was divorced, so, you know, we kind of had a free-for-all um, at our house. I lived in the basement. And so Mike came to live um, in one of the rooms in the basement with us, again, for a year or two. He was a definite wild guy. Um, but I say that the closest thing to a brother. He was my best friend at the time, and then we lived together, okay? So it's like we were brothers, you know, when we were like 17, 18, 19. And um, Mike, you know, we were all little drug addicts. I was much more of like a pothead psychedelic user and that sort of thing, but I dabbled in all kinds of stuff. He kind of got into, you know, cocaine and crack and all the stuff that was super popular back in the late 80s. And, uh, and he was reckless and he was a alcoholic, like he was a heavy, heavy alcoholic, even as a young guy. And uh, it started getting really bad, like he had a really bad cocaine addiction, again, as we, by the time we were about 19, and he started stealing and, you know, he was getting into a lot of real uh, dangerous stuff, um, you know, ripping off kids for crack and uh, just a lot of violence. Uh, you know, I won't get into all the details, but I had a good friend. Um, I'll just say his name. I don't know if anybody that I'm mentioning will ever watch this, but his name was Al Horky, good friend of mine, Dave Horky's dad. Al was a local teacher at the high school, and he was a strong believer. Uh, he taught Bible study at the church that I got saved at, um, or that I got discipled at. And he was always inviting me to Bible study. He was just, he had a real magnetic, he was just, you know, kind of a dad. He had a real magnetic uh, personality, and he would just always invite us, even though he knew we were just, you know, these little street punk drug rats. 
Um, but I was always interested. I was really fascinated. I wanted to go to Bible study. Like I was very open to check these things out. But he had been inviting me for probably, you know, two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someday I'm going to go. Well, this one particular night, I was supposed to go out with Mike. This is a long story. I, I apologize. I was supposed to go out with Mike, and uh, we were going to go to some concert. Well, he was late. He showed up really late, and I got real frustrated with him. And I was very upset with him again because he had been really going down this dark road of stealing and doing all sorts of different things. Um, he was supposed to come pick me up. He was late. So last minute, partially out of just frustration with Mike, I just said, you know, forget Mike. I'm going to Bible study tonight. You know, like I just remembered last minute, like, oh, yeah, you know, Al Horky's been inviting me to Bible study. I'm going to Bible study tonight. So I took off. And I went to Bible study, and uh, I, it was the first time in my life, you know, I had tried so many different drugs and psychedelics. It was the first time in my life that I sensed the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and it was magnetic. I was like, I want more of this. And that may sound strange to you if you go, you had a feeling, it, like, being someone who was a druggie accustomed to trying all these different experiences, I sensed as an unbeliever, I tasted the Holy Spirit and I wanted more. I was really fascinated. But again, this was my sort of introduction. First time I'd ever been to anything even close to a Bible study other than just, again, very nominal Catholic church when I was a kid. So I came home that night. Um, I was in bed and got a phone call from a mutual friend of ours and he said, hey, um, Mike died tonight. He got killed. We got in a big car accident. Um, Mike had a truck, and the truck rolled. They were doing about 80, and Mike went out the window. And I had been with him all day that day. He had just put that day this, um, he had wrapped his steering wheel with this leather grip. He had bought it at a well, uh, Kmart and um, put that on his steering wheel. As his truck was rolling, he went out the window, but his legs got caught in the steering wheel. His feet got caught in the steering wheel. He was hanging out the window. As you can imagine, um, his body was uh, devastated. I was supposed to be with him that night. Last minute, I went to Bible study. Okay, I'm telling you a bit of my testimony. Forgive me. In the days afterwards, um, I went to the site where the accident had happened, and on the side of the road, I found this little um, American flag decal that had been in his window, and it still had all the broken glass glued to the back of it. And I knew that his father was a Vietnam vet, and so I took that flag, and I brought it to his father's house, and I said, hey, you know, I wanted you to, to have this. Now, here's the point that I wanted to get to, and again, forgive me for telling this long story. Because Mike had been getting into doing all this crack and, and uh, violence and different things, like, it was bad. Like, um, again, he was ripping off kids in the inner city for crack, and uh, one day he came over to my house. He was hosing blood off of the bumper of his truck. You know, he had literally, like, ran a kid over in the, pro you know. And I was, even though I was a little drug addict, I was I was criticizing him. I was getting on his case constantly. I was like, Mike, what are you doing? Like, you need to slow down. You need to stop. You're going to kill someone. If you haven't already killed someone, you're going to kill one of us. You're going to kill yourself. Like, and, and no one likes someone that's always getting on their case, right? No one likes someone who is critiquing them. No one likes someone who is resisting them. No one likes that. And so Mike was also the life of the party. And again, I always wanted to be where the party was. But because I was always giving Mike a hard time, he would always take off on me. He would always ditch me. Okay, so the point is this. I was convinced that for the most part, Mike couldn't stand me. I was convinced that he, you know, just didn't like me anymore. He thought I was a, a wet towel or whatever. Mike dies. I go to his father's house. I give him the, the flag. And his big, strong father, Vietnam vet, he said, you know, he said, Mike was here just uh, a few days ago when we were talking. And you know what he told me? He said, you're the only friend that he has that really loves him. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, he told me that you're the only one that loves him enough to tell him to straighten out, that gives him a hard time. 
And, you know, and, and it was like a revelation, okay? It was one of those eye-opening moments. I swore that day. I made a vow. I said, Lord, for the rest of my life, I am not going to shut my mouth. When I see someone that I love who is in danger, when I see someone who I love whose life is at danger, who is hurting themselves, I'm not going to shut up and keep my mouth shut just so they will like me. Okay, because this is what we all have a tendency, a propensity to do. I swore, I said, Lord, I will speak the truth in love, even if it means that I have no friends. Now, again, you can take it too far, right? But this is something that formed the fabric of who I am today, and I strive to live by that. It's like sometimes vows can be dangerous, but I said, Lord, I want to speak the truth in love. Okay, so coming back to this issue. If you hold to the pre-tribulational rapture, please understand that the critique that we are offering, it is done because we genuinely believe that there is danger. The body of Christ, a large percentage of the body of Christ is in danger, like legitimate danger. And if by critiquing the pre-tribulational rapture, you know, there's a million people, and it will happen, you watch the comments in the YouTube, people will basically accuse us of not even knowing the Lord, okay? Like, I see this regularly. People will attack us, people will hate us. That's okay. The scriptures say this, the proverb says this. It says, the wounds of a friend, some translations say the, the blows of a friend, like the punches of a friend are to be trusted. In other words, a friend will hurt you. And then it says, but an enemy multiplies kisses. So as Paul the Apostle said, am I trying to make friends here? Or am I trying to serve the Lord? I want to be absolutely clear. Whether you agree with me or not, and I could be totally wrong, I, we are approaching this. Dalton and I are approaching this with genuine motivations to love those that we disagree with. And hopefully to warn and hopefully to wake up some, perhaps to save some from the dangers of the deception that are coming. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching. I wanted to bring you this important message though. As many of you are aware, the Lord has been doing a tremendous work in the global south over the last, let's say, 30 plus years. And now we're to the point uh, where the Lord has prepared a whole slew of workers. Uh, particularly from the Latino world, who are, who are desiring to go to the ends of the earth, to the remaining unreached people, predominantly in the Middle East, to, to, re, to, to go after them with the gospel. And they're passionate for the Lord. They care about Israel. They care about the lost. The one thing they lack is they lack funding, and they really lack the capacity within their home culture, in most cases, to do an adequate job of funding the work that they feel called to go and do. And that's where we come in. We can help them to complete the task that they feel so committed and connected to in terms of uh, reaching the lost, reaching the remaining unreached people that remain in the world. So you can help to join our mobilization initiative, and you can find that at faistudios.org. So go and check that out, and be a crit it's a critical way that you can join us in doing the Lord's work in the 1040 window. Back to the teaching. Okay, why does this issue matter? Why does this issue matter? And I'm going to touch on these things again and then kind of wrap it up. When I first got saved, again, going back to when I first got saved uh, in Massachusetts, you know, there was not a tremendous amount of believers back then. It seems like uh, Massachusetts, like everyone that was a believer was actually just part of a cult. You know, I'd be like, oh, you're a Christian? Well, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. What's that? You know, like I, this was a whole new world to me. But as soon as I got saved, I was very evangelistic and I quickly learned um, you know, about cults and different things. Started listening to Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man on the radio. And I started witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. I got to know Jehovah's Witnesses. And I remember I had this conversation with this Jehovah's Witness once. So the Jehovah's Witnesses, if you're not aware, what they teach is that uh, the um, Christians, so to speak, they're divided up into two different classes. They say you have the 144 um, anointed class. And they're calling, 144,000, they are called to be born again, to live in heaven, to rule and reign with Jesus. But then you also have the great multitude. That's a whole different category of Christian. We, uh, they would say, you know, everyone, because originally they used to say the 144,000 
were only those who lived to see the events of 1914. Again, Jehovah's Witness stuff, it's real technical. But the point is, anyone who is alive today, they used to say, was part of the great crowd. I think they've actually changed this doctrine recently because it was about to prove their prophecies wrong, but that's beside the point. So they call the everyone else who is a Christian, who's not part of the 144,000 anointed class, they call them the great multitude. And they say the great multitude, they're going to live on the earth. Okay, therefore, they don't need to be born of the spirit because they're not going to live in heaven. So what they do is they actually, the Jehovah's Witnesses, divide the New Testament up. They say, well, this passage is not for everyone. That's only for the 144,000. So if you talk to your average Jehovah's Witness, they go, I say, are you born again? Because the scriptures say, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And they go, well, I'm never going to see the kingdom of heaven anyway because I have an earthly calling. Therefore, I don't need to be born again. It also says in Romans 8 that if you don't have the spirit of Christ in you, in other words, if you're not born of the spirit, you are still dead in your sins. So think about this. The Jehovah's Witnesses, besides teaching that Jesus is not God and, and issues like that, they teach the average Jehovah's Witness, you cannot be born again. That verse is not for you. The very thing that is required for salvation is the new birth. And they say, no, that's not for you. Don't ask the Lord for that. Now, that's dangerous. That's destructive, right? So I was having this conversation with this Jehovah's Witness, and I said, look, and they also don't believe in hell. They believe in annihilationism. So the wicked ultimately are annihilated, but they also believe that the wicked will have a second chance when Jesus returns. You know, so it's actually like a lot more people will get saved, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, um, than, you know, narrow is the road that leads to life, but broad is the road that leads to destruction, as the scriptures say. So I was talking to this Jehovah's Witness, and I said, look, think about this. If you are wrong... If you are wrong, then according to evangelical Christian doctrine, you are not born again, you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. If you are wrong, you will go to hell. If I am wrong, I'm a good person, I'm try this is what Jehovah's Witnesses would teach, I'm trying to serve the Lord to the best of my knowledge, that when Jesus returns, I'll have a second chance, I won't go to hell, I'll actually be resurrected and basically have a second chance and, and be resurrected and enjoy life in paradise on earth. I said, so if you're wrong, you go to hell forever. If I'm wrong, I'm fine. I said, if you're a gambling person, it makes much more sense for you just to become a Christian. There's no risk. There's no danger. You're covered. But if you stay a Jehovah's Witness, you risk going to hell forever. Okay. So you go, you don't choose theology based on these things, to be clear. But the point is this, the same sort of principle that applies to Jehovah's Witnesses applies very much to the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture versus the pre-wrath, post-tribulational rapture. Which, by the way, let me just say this, in terms of our schedule, because I didn't actually finish talking about our schedule after we work through all of these things, after we work through all of the passages and texts and arguments that pre-tribbers use, after I work through the, the survey of what did the early church believe, after I work through all of those things, at the end, I am actually going to geek out into a few sessions on the differences between pre-wrath and post-trib. And I'm going to lay out what I believe are the strengths and weaknesses of both positions and I'm going to offer my view, which I believe is kind of a hybrid, kind of a mixture between the pre-wrath and the post-trib perspective. And this is why I've always said that I am both pre-wrath and post-trib. And it kind of drives people crazy. They're like, choose one. And I go, no, actually, I think the Bible actually teaches something that's in between the two. That's actually going to be at the end. So if you are a pre-wrather or a post-tribber, then... Those will be the, the uh, sessions that you'll really be excited about. Okay, now, again, back to the sort of just pragmatic theology. If pre-tribbers are wrong, now please, again, if you, are, if you hold to the pre-tribulational rapture, then please listen to me and, and try to be honest. If there is no pre-tribulational rapture, and if suddenly the church finds itself facing the Antichrist, facing the Great Tribulation, I want to be absolutely clear. I am not saying that all pre-tribbers will fall away and be part of the great apostasy. Absolutely not. That's ridiculous. 
However, I think it's quite fair to say that in light of the dogmatic, absolute manner in which it's often taught, because it's not taught as, well, I lean toward the pre-trib perspective. I think the Bible teaches that. I think it's, it's taught like this is the gospel truth. As I said, I've had people essentially ask me if I'm even a Christian because I don't believe in the pre-tribulational rapture. I go, what, like, you think the timing of the rapture defines whether or not you're even saved? Numerous people saying, like, how could Joel be so smart and not believe in the pre-tribulational rapture? Like, he's so deceived. He's such a deceiver. He's a false teacher. And the, like, really strong, um, you know, statements. And that's okay. But in light of how absolute, dogmatic it's taught, if suddenly the church finds itself facing the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation, the potential, this is all I'm saying, is the potential for tremendous disappointment at the very least. I mean, absolutely everyone will be disappointed, period. But the potential for tremendous confusion. As I said, the vast majority of Christians today are very good students of their teachers. They actually go, I like this guy, therefore I believe whatever he teaches. You get a lot of people that, I'm, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of, you know, this one. They choose teachers they like, and whatever that teacher teaches, they go along with. I don't want you to do that. I want you to be a Berean. But there's no question that there will be numerous multitudes of Christians that will be incredibly confused, incredibly confused, potentially heartbroken. They will absolutely lose any trust in these teachers. Like if you are a pre-tribulational teacher and you're wrong, no one is going to listen to you ever again. Like They're going to be like, you promised me that we would never see these things. And here we are facing the great tribulation. You know, like the, the lack of confidence in teachers will be devastating. But here's the biggest danger, the potential for shipwreck, the potential for potentially even seeing Christians apostatize and walk away from the faith because they weren't doctrinally, emotionally, intellectually prepared. They were like, no, I was told absolutely we will never see this. And then they have to face the pain and the realities of these things. If the pre-tribulational rapture of the church is wrong, there is tremendous danger. Now, if I'm wrong, worst case, I'm pleasantly surprised and I get raptured earlier than I thought. Like for me, it's win-win. There's no danger for me. If I'm preparing to face the Antichrist in tribulations, worst case, I might face a tribulation in my life, which really has been the past couple of years with uh, my wife being sick. I'm preparing for normal things anyway. Worst case, I get raptured earlier. No sweat off my brow. If, on the other hand, the pre-tribbers are wrong, the potential damage to the church is legitimate. Now, again, you may say, but I'm still dyed in the wool pre-trib. That's fine. But you have to acknowledge that what I'm saying here is valid, that this is, that the, the difference between the two is very significant. Now, let me just end by touching on some final, I think, very relevant verses. I've sort of just rambled and told stories and shared my opinion. In Matthew 24, 9 through 13, Jesus said this, Speaking of the great tribulation, he says, then they will deliver you to tribulation and they will kill you. Like, this is serious stuff. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name, because of the name of Jesus. He's speaking to Christians. He's talking about the tribulation. He's talking to his disciples. He says, you will be hated. Anytime we read this, we say you. Now, here's what's interesting. The pre-tribulationists will say this passage is not for us. We don't need to heed this. We don't need to worry about this warning because we're going to be out of here anyway. This is only for the Messianic Jews. They can part in the same way the Jehovah's Witnesses break up the New Testament and say, this is for the 144,000. This is not for us. I don't need to worry about this. I don't need to worry about this. Dispensational pre-tribulationists do the same thing. They say Matthew 24 is not for the church. This is only for this particular group of people. They are the tribulation saints, or specifically the Jewish tribulation saints. These are the Jews who will get saved during the tribulation. That's who this is for. But it's not for us, so we don't need to heed the warning. Do you see the commonalities? Do you see why I brought up the issue of Jehovah's Witnesses? I'll actually probably bring that up again with some other text. And then Jesus said this. 
at that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. He's talking about the believers who will be hated because of the name of Jesus during the tribulation. He says, many will fall away. Many in the church today say, once saved, always saved. I can never fall away. And I go, okay, I have a high view of the sovereignty of God. But the combination of these two doctrines, one that says, once you pray a prayer, you're good forever. And the other one that says, you're not going to face the tribulation anyway. The combination of those two doctrines have the potential. They do have the potential to essentially rob large segments of the church not to be prepared. And it may potentially be setting many up for the great falling away. This is a profound warning from Jesus. I think we should all heed it. I think we should all pay attention to it. He says, many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Deception will be the earmark of that day. Deception will be the earmark of that day. Therefore, truth matters. We need to be diligent against deception because lawlessness will be increased. Most people's love will grow cold. The hearts of most will grow cold. And he says, but the one who endures to the end, that's the one that will be saved. I think this warning, these statements from Jesus matter. I think the church right now needs to be paying attention to these things. Are we preparing our flocks? Are we preparing those who listen to us? Are we preparing our hearts to endure faithfully until the end? I don't care what your position is with regard to the rapture. You need to be preparing your people and your heart, my heart and your heart, to endure faithfully until the end. Anyone who's not preparing to do this is failing. They're failing individually, and if you're a pastor or a shepherd and you're not preparing your flock to endure faithfully until the end, you are failing in your role as a shepherd and a pastor. This is one of the premier calls and mandates of the shepherds in this hour is to prepare the people for the storms that are already upon us. Matthew 16 Verse 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things from the chief elders and priests and scribes, and he will be killed. He starts telling his disciples, I need to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer, and they're going to kill me. And he will be raised up on the third day. I'm going to be overcome, but that's okay. I'm going to overcome the world. I am going to overcome death. I'm going to overcome this world by allowing myself to be overcome. Peter, go to old Peter, pulled him aside. He pulls Jesus aside, and he began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid! No! Bad theology! You know, God will protect you. You know, all of the positive mantras that we hear preached in modern church today, particularly here in the West, this shall never happen to you. And look, well-intentioned. Peter loved his friend. Of course, I don't want you to suffer and to be killed. How did Jesus respond? He turned and he said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. What you're saying is evil. And then listen to this, please. He says, you are a stumbling block to me. You should be affirming me. You should be preparing me, helping me, praying with me to endure the things that I'm about to endure. Stand with me as I lay down my life. He says, no, but you are setting your mind on the things of man. You don't have your mind set on God's interests. You don't understand the wisdom, the upside down, inside out wisdom of the cross. Now, I'm going to end right here. Revelation 13, 5 through 10. Talking about the Antichrist, talking about the beast. There was given him a mouth, speaking arrogant words, blasphemous things. And he had authority to act for 42 months. That's three and a half years. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God. So here is the quintessential, final, ultimate blasphemer. And he blasphemes the name of God. He blasphemes and speaks out against the tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. He speaks out against all that is holy. And then here it is. It was given to him. Authority from God is given to the beast to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So right now, 
I am in the position of standing here as a teacher, declaring to the body of Christ that this is for you and for me. This is for the church. This is for the saints. This is for, when it says saints, it means you and me, not just some special class of tribulation saints, you know, that get saved later. We don't have to worry about it because we're going to be out of here. And in the same way that I'm saying, we must prepare to suffer and to die, to lay down our lives, to endure till the end. There's going to be a thousand people out there rebuking me. Not so. You don't know the wisdom of God. It will never be. Maybe well-intentioned. But what I'm saying is you don't have the things of God in mind. You have the wisdom of man. It is not the wisdom of the cross to say, never, God forbid, it shall not be. That won't happen to you. Listen, the scriptures are clear that the church is about to step into a season and identify with their master in the same way that Jesus overcame this world by being overcome We also, as his disciples, as his students, must imitate our master, bear witness to the world, lay down our lives as faithful witnesses, as faithful martyrs. We must imitate him. He despised the shame of the cross, but for the joy set before him, he endured it. And we are called to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, And understand that the call that's on our lives, we have been chosen of all the peoples throughout the earth. He chose you and me. And this is the calling that we have to imitate him. Guys, I'm telling you, these things matter. The difference between what I'm saying, the church needs to be prepared for this, versus saying, glory to God, we're out of here. We don't have to see any of this. This is just for those other suckers. And you go, what's the difference between them and us? Well, they got saved past a particular date. They are the tribulation saints. We don't have to endure this. God loves us too much. Well, doesn't he love them? Hey, guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching, but we wanted to make you aware of a gathering that we're hosting in Dallas, Texas, July 13th, 14th, and 15th of 2023. It's called the Maranatha End Times Summit. You can go to maranathasummit.com for more information. It's going to be a very powerful time together in the word going deep in the subject of the end of the age and the return of the Lord. We hope to see you there. Go to maranathasummit.com for all the information, details, and registration information. We're going to get into this more. I'm going to end right here, guys. I just, I wanted to kind of open up to share my heart. Again, I know that I'm kind of rambling and telling stories and so forth, but again, just to be clear, these things matter. These things matter a lot. And please understand that we're not approaching this to try to make enemies. I'm sure we will make some enemies, but we're doing it out of the sincerity of our heart, believing that the things that we speak, that this is actually the word of the Lord for the church right now. And this is why we're going after this right now. And we just ask that you would please approach these things as Bereans. Give us the benefit of the doubt. Take the time to listen. Open up the Bible and prayerfully consider the things that we're about to share. So amen and amen. I'm going to end it right here. Look forward to Dalton jumping into all of the primary rapture texts. And then um, when he's done after a few sessions, I'll jump back and we'll see you then.